people who call themselves Christians use birth control. This is an extremely serious issue because the Bible actually condemns birth control as evil. The best example of this comes from the story of Onan in Genesis chapter 38. The story is well known. Onan's brother was named Ur. Ur died leaving his wife Tamar a widow. Onan was told to marry Tamar, his brother's widow, and raise up seed for his brother. This was the custom at the time. So Onan married Tamar and had relations with her, but he wasted his seed upon the ground so that Tamar would not get pregnant. As a result, God struck Onan dead. This is the only place in the Bible where we read that someone actually used birth control. The issue seems pretty clear. Birth control is a grave evil in the eyes of God, and Onan was struck dead for it. However, countless people, non-Catholics as well as many false Catholics, have attempted to explain the story away. They argue that Onan was not killed because he used birth control, but for other reasons. In this video, I will discuss why those arguments are not tenable. Onan married Tamar, his brother's widow, because it was part of what is called the Leverate marriage custom. This ancient custom was subsequently incorporated into the Mosaic Law, as we read in Deuteronomy 25.5. Quote, when brothers live together and one of them dies and has no son, the wife of the deceased shall not be married outside the family to a strange man. Her husband's brother shall go into her and take her to himself as wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. End quote. The purpose of this law was that the name of the dead brother, in this case Ur, would be carried on by the son born to his widow. Since Ur died without a son, no one would carry on his name or take his property. By taking Ur's widow Tamar as a wife and having a son by her, Onan would enable Ur's name to be carried on in the son born to Tamar, even though that child would be fathered by Onan. In accordance with this custom, Onan's father Judah said this to him, as we read in Genesis 38.8, Then Judah said to Onan, Go in to your brother's wife and perform your duty as a brother-in-law to her, and raise up offspring for your brother. End quote. But in Genesis 38, 9-10, we read, quote, Onan knew that the offspring would not be his, so when he went in to his brother's wife, he wasted his seed on the ground, in order not to give offspring to his brother. But what he did was displeasing in the sight of the Lord so he took his life also." End quote. Some translations say that what he did was wicked or detestable in the sight of the Lord. Now, the first argument raised by those who defend birth control is that Onan was not killed for wasting his seed upon the ground, or coitus interruptus, but rather for failing to fulfill the levirate marriage custom. In other words, they argue that Onan was killed for failing in the duty he was supposed to fulfill for his brother, not for using birth control or wasting his seed upon the ground. In a YouTube video called Is Birth Control Biblical, a Protestant named Tim Conway articulates the typical pro-birth control response on this matter. Is there a Bible verse in all the Bible that speaks clearly about birth control? There is not. Now, some people will argue and say there is. Let me tell you the verse that they typically argue from. Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord put him to death. Then Judah said to Onan, Onan was Ur's brother, Go into your brother's wife and perform the duty of a brother-in-law to her and raise up offspring for your brother. But Onan knew that the offspring would not be his. So whenever he went into his brother's wife, he would waste the semen on the ground so as not to give offspring to his brother. And what he did was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord put him to death. So people look at that and they say, See? That's a form of birth control and God put him to death. But look, 
God doesn't say that the sin of Onan was birth control. He says, well here, let me tell you, there was a law in Israel. Listen to what the law said, Deuteronomy 25.5. If brothers dwell together and one of them dies and has no son, the wife of the dead man shall not be married outside the family to a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go into her and take her as his wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. And the first son whom she bears will succeed to the name of his dead brother, that his name may not be blotted out of Israel. Folks, as far as birth control is concerned, the Bible nowhere seems to forbid it. Neither does it endorse it, by the way. But that text right there is not saying that Onan committed birth control and God killed him. The problem was that Onan knew that the firstborn child would not be his own. It would be his brother's. That's why he didn't want to do it. God killed him because he wickedly refused to do what was a law in Israel to be done. What a brother should have done to another brother. The argument he makes is false and it is refuted by the fact that the penalty set down in Deuteronomy 25 for failing to fulfill the Leverate marriage custom, for failing in one's duty toward his brother, was not death but only a slight humiliation. Deuteronomy 25, 7-10, But if the man does not desire to take his brother's wife, then his brother's wife shall go up to the gate to the elders and say, my husband's brother refuses to establish a name for his brother in Israel. He is not willing to perform the duty of a husband's brother to me. Then the elders of his city shall summon him and speak to him. And if he persists and says, I do not desire to take her, then his brother's wife shall come to him in the sight of the elders and pull his sandal off his foot and spit in his face. And she shall declare, Thus it is done to the man who does not build up his brother's house. In Israel his name shall be called the house of him whose sandal is removed. End quote. As we can see, the penalty for failing to raise up seed to one's brother, for failing to fulfill the marriage custom, was merely a minor humiliation. The woman would remove the offender's sandal, spit in his face, and embarrass him before the community. The man would be considered disreputable, but he would not be killed. In Genesis 38, Onan is killed because he did something that the man described in Deuteronomy 25 did not do. Onan wasted his seed upon the ground. He performed the sexual act in an unnatural manner. He used birth control, and God killed him for it. This point is confirmed by the fact that Onan was killed by God for his act before the Mosaic Law was established. That is to say, the Leverite marriage custom according to which a brother would marry his brother's widow and raise up seed for his brother, was only a custom at the time of Onan. This custom would not be incorporated into the laws of Israel until the time of Moses. So, let's consider this carefully. According to the defenders of birth control, God killed Onan not for birth control, but for violating what was only a marriage custom. Yet, when the same custom was officially incorporated into the law of Moses, those who violated it were only humiliated. They were not killed. Why would the penalty for violating the marriage custom be more severe, bringing death in Onan's time before the custom became law, and less severe after the law of Moses ratified the custom? It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make sense because Onan was not killed for failing to fulfill the Leverate marriage custom. Onan was killed in Genesis 38 for using birth control, for wasting his seed upon the ground, for the unnatural sexual act he performed. That's something that the man in Deuteronomy 25 did not do. The man in Deuteronomy 25 did refuse to take his brother's wife. Hence, both Onan and the man in Deuteronomy 25 failed to fulfill the custom and give offspring to their brother, but only one of them wasted his seed upon the ground. That was Onan, not the man in Deuteronomy 25, and that's why Onan was killed and the man in Deuteronomy 25 was not. The next objection that defenders of birth control raise is that Onan was killed for failing to obey his father Judah who told him to marry his brother's widow and raise up seed for his brother. 
But as Genesis 2.24 says, when a man marries a wife, he leaves his father and his mother. Onan would not be obligated to obey all the wishes of his father once he had taken a wife, and thus he would not be killed for failing to obey his father. In fact, in failing to give offspring to his brother, the man in Deuteronomy 25 failed to obey Moses, the laws of Israel in place at that time, the practice of the community, and the will of many fathers who observed those laws. But he was not killed. Thus, this objection is false. Another point of extreme importance, which further sheds light on the true meaning of this passage in Genesis 38, is this. If Onan was killed only for his selfishness or his lack of charity, for failing in his duty toward his brother, as advocates of birth control frequently contend, then he was killed for what he failed to do, not for what he did. But the inspired text of scripture says that Onan was killed precisely for what he did, not for what he failed to do. Genesis 38:9-10. Quote, when he went into his brother's wife, he wasted his seed on the ground in order not to give offspring to his brother. But what he did was displeasing in the sight of the Lord, so he took his life also. End quote. This brings us to another point. By describing Onan's sexual act in graphic terms, the text gives us another insight into the reason Onan was killed. If Onan simply failed in his obligation to his brother, and the sexual act he performed was indifferent, why would the sacred writer include a graphic description of Onan's act, that is, that he wasted his seed upon the ground? The text gives us this detailed description of the sexual act precisely because that act was the reason for Onan's condemnation. If that were not the reason for his condemnation, the details would be unnecessary. Instead, the sacred author would have simply indicated that Onan was cold toward his brother or lacked concern for his fellow man, or simply that he failed to raise up offspring for his brother. There would be no need to mention the wasting of the seed upon the ground. With all of these facts in mind, there is no doubt that the sin of Onan was birth control. The wasting of the seed upon the ground, an unnatural sexual act. This of course has application to other forms of birth control and other unnatural sexual acts, which are also condemned in the Bible such as homosexuality and masturbation. Throughout Christian history, it was recognized that birth control is evil and condemned by God in the Bible. The fathers of the church condemned birth control in strong terms. They condemned the wasting of the seed, and they recognized that Onan's sin consisted in the same. The Catholic Church has always taught that birth control is evil, and that Onan was condemned for it. In his 1930 encyclical, Pope Pius XI solemnly declared that any use of matrimony exercised in such a way that the act is deliberately frustrated in its natural power to generate life is an offense against the law of God and of nature, and those who indulge in such are branded with the guilt of a grave sin. He also taught that Onan was killed for this sin, and that the primary purpose of the marriage act, the begetting of children, must not be subordinated to other things. This subordination occurs in all forms of birth control. Even the first Protestants, such as Martin Luther and John Calvin, condemned birth control in extremely strong terms. Luther considered the deliberate spilling of seed for birth control to be worse than adultery or incest, while Calvin considered it to be monstrous and evil. Until the 1930 Lambeth Conference held by the Anglican sect, basically all Protestant groups condemned birth control as evil. At the 1930 Lambeth Conference, the Anglicans approved birth control on a limited basis in accordance with secularizing trends. Once the Anglicans gave in, almost all Protestant groups did the same. Another point of interest is what God told Jeremiah. As Charles Provan points out in his book, The Bible and Birth Control, quote, When God told Jeremiah not to have children in Palestine due to the upcoming invasion of the Babylonian army, he instructed him not to get married which makes no sense if God allows deliberately non-procreative sex in marriage." End quote. There are a number of reasons that God condemns birth control. First, it contradicts the primary purpose he ordained for the Marriage Act, namely, the begetting of children. 
Second, children are unequivocally declared to be a blessing in Scripture, while childlessness is often a punishment. Exodus 23, 25-26, quote, But you shall serve the Lord your God, and he will bless your bread and your water, and I will remove sickness from your midst. There shall be no one miscarrying or barren in your land, end quote. Hosea 9.11 As for Ephraim, their glory will fly away like a bird. No birth, no pregnancy, and no conception. End quote. Third, Scripture specifically teaches that God is the one who opens and shuts the womb. Genesis 20.18 For the Lord had closed fast all the wombs of the household of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. End quote. Genesis 29.31 now the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, and he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. End quote. Genesis 30, 1-2, And Rachel, seeing herself without children, envied her sister, and said to her husband, Give me children, otherwise I shall die. And Jacob, being angry with her, answered, Am I as God, who hath deprived thee of the fruit of thy womb? End quote. Genesis 30, 22, quote, the Lord also remembering Rachel heard her and opened her womb. End quote. Deuteronomy 1.10 quote, For the Lord your God hath multiplied you. End quote. 1 Samuel 2.21 quote, The Lord visited Hannah, and she conceived and gave birth to three sons and two daughters. End quote. In 1 Chronicles 25.5 we read that God gave fourteen sons and three daughters to He-Man. It's a truth of divine revelation that God opens and shuts the womb. Thus, to deliberately avoid children, as people do when they engage in artificial contraception or other so-called natural means of birth control, is to directly offend against God. It is to impose your will on God who opens and shuts the womb. It is to proclaim that you know better than God does about whether a new life should come into your life. It is to thwart His design and shut out from your presence that which he describes as a blessing. It is always done for selfish reasons which betray a lack of faith in God and his providence. Psalm 127, 3-5, Behold, children are a gift of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. How blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. End quote. The birth control deception is monumental. It is leading countless souls to hell. 1 Timothy 2.15 Yet she, woman, shall be saved through childbearing, if she continue in faith and love and sanctification with sobriety. End quote. In another video, we will examine why so-called natural means of birth control that are used to avoid conception, such as rhythm and natural family planning, are also gravely sinful for they constitute a deliberate plan to avoid children while engaging in the marriage act. Those methods are no 